I'm Megan Benton. I'm Assistant Director for Research in the International Programme here at MPI. I don't have a glass to ting, just a paper cup. <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome to those of you who are joining us in person for our event, uh, Merit-Based Immigration, Designing Successful Selection Systems. And also welcome to those of you who are joining us from your, from your desks or from home or from your beds, no judgment, um, <laughs> on the live stream. <laughs> and just to tell you all as well that this event is being live streamed and you'll be able to watch it again later if you'd like. Um, Today, call today's event timely would be a bit of an understatement. Um, uh, obviously, it's extremely timely because of President Trump's announcement yesterday um, where he called for a merit and heart-based system. But I think it's also timely because this question of how countries attract the thinkers, entrepreneurs, workers, managers to drive innovation and economic growth is really going to be at the heart of future economic competitiveness. Um, and I'm delighted to be moderating this event with um, three very deep thinkers on immigrant selection systems. Um, Jean-Christophe Dumont, um, who is head of the International Migration Division at the OECD. We're very pleased to have you here. Um, Dimitri Papadimitriou needs no, no um, real introduction. Uh, he is our esteemed founder and president emeritus and has just kind of pursued a sideline on thinking about labor migration over, I don't know, several centuries. Um, <laughs> and then finally, we have Julia Gillette, who's from our US uh, immigration uh, policy program. And um, she's one of the, um, the leads on a new exciting project on rethinking um, the US legal migration system. Um, biographies for everyone are on your chairs. Um, for those of you at home in particular, I also wanted to note that you can tweet questions to at Migration Policy. You can also use the hashtag MPI Discuss. Or if you have a question you'd like to email, the email address is events at migrationpolicy.org. And because of that, I'll be checking my phone. I am not watching for something that's ending on eBay. I am uh, checking for questions. <laughs> All right. Just by way of an introduction, I wanted to start with a confession. And I think it's only really Dimitri who knows this. But I am um, a reformed academic and actually um, trained in a kind of philosophical uh, type of uh, academia, the worst kind. Um, and as part of my training, we always get told to define your terms, define your terms. So whenever anyone talks about merit-based immigration, the tiny little quashed academic inside me says, define your terms. Um, I think that we are often talking about two different things. Obviously, the Trump administration often uses this term to talk about shifting from um, uh, family and, and refugees to some extent towards a larger share of economic migrants. But we also use the term to um, describe how you select among labor migrants, and in particular, bringing in people who have particular skills and attributes, in other words, shifting to a points-based system and away from leaving things primarily in the hands of employers. But even then, I think a points-based system really lends itself to easy caricatures. Um, and, and as you all in the room know, um, many countries that have had the kind of epitome of a points-based system have actually been moving away from just selecting people on the basis of their human capital attributes uh, and, and, and giving more value to having an employment offer, for instance. Um, and I know that Dimitri and John Christophe are going to talk today about one of the most cutting edge innovations uh, to have come out of places like Canada in recent years that does this hybrid work. Um, the expression of interest scheme, which creates a pool of qualified screened um, um, candidates who employers can select from and in a way that reduces backlogs and also allows for some complex fine tuning of the system to serve different economic <coughs> objectives. So really, when we talk about a merit-based system, we are not talking about just a points-based system. What we're talking about is a dynamic, agile system that is actively managed by the government in a way that is very hands-on um, and that carefully calibrates and thinks about the profile of the future workforce. Um, so with that in mind, I just wanted to say that I think what it would be great to discuss today um, is firstly, what are the fundamental principles that robust selection systems are based on, especially when you're talking about not just today's, but long-term economic growth? Um, how can countries, and especially the US, import the best policy innovations while bearing in mind um, its idiosyncratic um, political and governance context? Um, and how is this affected by the dra dramatic labor market disruption? that we're seeing both in terms of 
how automation, artificial intelligence will change the profile of jobs that many sectors have, but also how there will be growing competition from new destinations, uh, new forms of employment that move beyond the traditional employer and employee model. How do these questions affect selection itself? Okay, so I'm going to turn first to Jean-Christophe. He's going to talk a little bit about the Canadian system, but also the kind of where the debate is at in Europe. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for <coughs> the invitation uh, and the opportunity to come for the first time to the MPI. But, uh, but I know uh, that you've been connected to the OECD for a very long time. So that's, uh, that's really a great pleasure to be here, and especially on that topic, uh, which, uh, as has been said, is, is topical, but uh, also is at the heart of uh, many uh, policy changes in, in many OECD countries. Uh, certainly not only uh, in the US, but also in Europe, and also under constant uh, thinking and reform in, in the countries which have uh, invented the model in a way, so uh, starting with, with New Zealand, Australia, and, and Canada. What I want to, to start with is, if I can, okay, that's good. Um, so it's by saying basically that all countries have channel for uh, admitting highly skilled workers, um, uh, including including the, the US, uh, which has some already some merit-based uh, channels. But obviously, the question, uh, are these programs functioning well? Uh, are these programs admitting or attracting? Uh, are these programs competitive in international comparison? Uh, and I will try to answer some of that question based on, on OECD work that has been carried out in this area with a number of country reviews, in-depth country <coughs> review that we did on New Zealand, Australia, Canada will come out in a couple of weeks. Uh, but also, uh, especially on, on Europe, I will, I will uh, explain later. Um, let me start with some numbers to put things uh, into perspective. I mean, the U.S. number, you know, you know them, one million permanent immigrants every year. Interesting to note that this number is e exactly the same in Europe. So U.S. and Europe, even if Europe is a bit bigger, are tracking as many uh, permanent migrants, but obviously uh, what probably uh, makes a difference is uh, the share of family migration has been said. Uh, in, in the U.S., uh, here we're talking about 70% uh, of uh, family-based migration. Uh, when in Canada and Australia, and there is uh, a first uh, caveat here, depending on how you count accompanying family members of principal applicants. So if you don't count them, it would be like 26% family migration uh, in, in Australia and Canada. If you count them, then you get around 60-65%, which is at the end not so far from, from the US figure. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, what, what is interesting also in this graph, it shows the number of tertiary educated immigrants uh, in in Europe and other OECD countries and the US. It excludes intra-EU migrants because it would make no sense to, to include them in that comparison. 46% of tertiary educated immigrants in the OECD are in the US, uh, again, excluding intra-EU migrants. So the US uh, is not doing that bad uh, if you look from this perspective. Uh, <laughs> But uh, what you can, you can see, so basically as, as a bigger share than what it represents on international migration in general and population-wise, but uh, what you can see in the second uh, uh, graph here is that in terms of growth, the U.S. is doing less well than most of other OECD countries. So the, the, the strategic advantage of the U.S. regarding ISK migration seems to be weakening, and, and the growth rate is about half that of Australia, is about 30% less than, than Canada and lower than most European countries, as you can see on this graph. Second thing is uh, US uh, admits uh, a number of um, uh, highly skilled people through its temporary program, uh, but we're talking only about 60,000 uh, 60, people around. Uh, this, is, uh, this is as much as Canada and Australia, but obviously for country of very different size. This is also at, uh, uh, as much as, as Europe, if you exclude UK, if you don't do that yet, uh, then the US is like 50% lower than, than Europe uh, in, in its permanent program for highly skilled migrants uh, specifically. So clearly, 
the U.S. punched below its weight in the global competition for Thailand, and 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 raised the raise point here. Uh, last slide on, on data is about students because we know how much students are important uh, in bringing skills to, uh, to destination country. <laughs> and here again you can see from this slide that the US and Europe are almost at par uh, on that. Uh, Canada and Australia uh, as a percentage of our population are at actually attracting more international uh, students. So clearly US is in the competition but it may, may lose some grounds uh, in, in some respects. So what has been just mentioned uh, is the fact that a number of OECD countries have made important changes in their immigration system uh, recently. And uh, what I, I will spend a little bit of time explaining now is this expression of interest system that was uh, um, uh, invented by, by New Zealand in 2004, uh, adopted by Australia in 2012, uh, transferred to uh, Canada in 2015, and more recently to Quebec, was adopted since September uh, 2018, uh, a similar system. Um, this, uh, um, uh, um, it's, it's, it includes a point-based system in a way, but it's not reduced to that perspective. Uh, point-based system in itself are not policies, they are tools. Uh, <coughs> And uh, it's probably the most advanced way to, to select, uh, to select uh, uh, ID skilled migrants across the OECD. Again, a number of European countries are completing that uh, uh, very closely. The, in, in a nutshell, the system works is a two-step migration system. So the first step, potential immigrants express an interest by submitting their profile electronically from wherever they are. Um, those who meet minimum requirements enter into what we call a pool, um, and they are ranked within that pool according to a point-based system. Uh, in the second stage, uh, people are drawn from the pool, and uh, those who are selected uh, are invited uh, to apply, and then the uh, immigration uh, process uh, re really uh, starts. Uh, so. What is important to have in mind is that there are some common elements uh, in, in the free system, but they are quite different in terms of implementation. Um, language and education are uh, obviously uh, taken into account in, in the requirements for entering the pool in all the countries. Uh, professional uh, experience, occupational uh, profile is only uh, uh, valued in Australia and, and New Zealand. Also, countries differ in terms of how long you stay in the pool. In New Zealand, this is six months. In Australia, this is two years. In Canada, this is one year. This, these are important differences. There are also differences in terms of who can pick people in the pool. In New Zealand, this is only the immigration <coughs> authorities. Uh, in Australia, the region, the, the provinces can, can pick people in the pool. In Canada, this is both the region and also the employers to some extent. So differences into, in, into the functioning of, of this program. It's important to understand that these are tools like point-based system. They are not really immigration programs. These are tools that enable the, the existing programs to function uh, normally. So in, in the case of, of Canada, uh, this is connected to the Federal Skilled Worker Program, to the Canadian Experience Class Program, to the Federal Skills Trade Program, and to the Provincial Nominee Programs. These programs still exist, but the, the, the expression of interest system is like the doorway through which people enter uh, the program. In terms of impact, uh, we have, as I said, analyzed this program, and, and I think they made quite a difference. The first reason why they were uh, implemented in the first place is because all these countries were facing huge backlogs. In Canada, the backlog could go up to six years and also very long processing times. So uh, the program has, uh, this, this system has certainly helped a great deal in reducing that. In Canada, now 80% of the application are processed within six months. In New Zealand, you know, the pool is six months, so all applications are processed within six months. In Australia, it takes between four and six months compared to pre -year, three years previously. So these programs are really made a big difference in terms of, of reducing backlog and, 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 and uh, uh, fostering the processing of this application. Where uh, now they also uh, allow to, to have more diverse profile because they allow different draws. They also, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, have been linked to some matching tools, so job vacancies. 
Um, but in practice, it's fair to say that the employers are not using this tool very much, so it doesn't really deliver as much as expected on this one. Uh, we also have some evidence that the, the, the outcomes of immigrants uh, are, uh, are improved uh, through, through this new uh, selection system. But I think one very important, and I will come back to that, is most of the people in the pool are abroad, but most of those who are selected are already in the country. So this is two-step or maybe three-step migration, if you want to call it this way. When does it make sense to, to consider applying that? When certainly when there are CAP and overload programs, maybe the US comes to mind here, when you want to encourage uh, employers' uh, involvement in the process or when, when you want to uh, increase the appeal to some less uh, popular migration program or, or local areas. What we did is an evaluation of the transferability of the system to Europe. I can say this is quite challenging for, for many reasons, uh, but, but you have that in mind, the main instrument that the European uh, Union has developed regarding highly skilled migration is called the Blue Card. This is a permit which exists in 25 member states, so not in the UK, Ireland, or Denmark. It's for highly educated people with a job offer and a salary, <coughs> which is 1.5, the average of a national uh, salary, and uh, it enables uh, the spouse to come and to work, uh, and so it's, it's the tool that the EU has developed to compete the, with, a, with a green card, to, to say it uh, very briefly. So we, we have done this study, which is called uh, Building a EU Talent Pool on Your Approach to Immigration Management, it was done by um, Maria Vicenza Desiderio and Jonathan Chaloff at the uh, OECD. Uh, and in that uh, work, we propose uh, three options uh, uh, to adapt the system uh, to, to the EU context. With this idea of promoting a single EU uh, uh, lab labor market, uh, branding the EU, and also finding ways to mutualize some resources between, uh, between EU countries in terms of recognition <coughs> of foreign qualification, promotion campaign, or even uh, some uh, um, uh, migration processing. So what we have looked at uh, is uh, a first solution, which is basically minimum requirements, creating a common pool within which all countries can then pick. Second option is doing the same, but going a step further for some selected occupation which are in need across the EU where you could get a ranking <coughs> and you could get a common, common decision making uh, to select people. And a third option, which is the most ambitious, which is about creating this pool but enabling uh, then, uh, based on a numerical limit and a common ranking system, uh, to offer job search visas to those who are ranked top uh, in this pool, enabling them to come to EU countries, look for jobs, and, and then qualify for national schemes. The issue here being that there is a, 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 a division of labor between, between the EU and member states with the subsidiary principle applying but ultimately, it's only the member states who can decide uh, who can come in, in, in the EU. So that's, that's one way uh, to, to adapt that to the EU. Uh, it's fair to say that the discussion at the EU level are blocked uh, uh, not only on asylum, but also on some other issues, including uh, revision of a blue card and certainly uh, any options that would go beyond that, uh, like uh, uh, implementing an expression of interest system in the EU context. Would it make, what, what would make sense in, in the US context? And I will end with these two slides. Uh, if you take lessons learned from other uh, OECD countries, uh, first of all, point-based system is not a silver bullet. As I said, it's not a policy by itself. Second, uh, uh, wage-based criteria have limitation, and we can discuss that in more, in more detail. But uh, uh, this is certainly a, a question uh, that, that, that is, has been uh, apply with, with diverse results across the OECD. The third point is that there is absolutely a need, and I will, that would be my last slide after this one, there is a need to think carefully about temporary admission and transition from temporary to permanent. Um, it's also necessary to uh, identify uh, uh, long-term needs, because if you uh, select people uh, for permanent residence, these people will be around for quite some time, 
and, and so the selection should not only be based on short-term needs or on criteria that you, uh, that you can identify uh, um, with, with a profile of people, but more on their capacity to manage <coughs> the society in, in the long term. But I think the most important point are the next one, is the need to have a flexible and adaptable framework for any merit-based system. I think one of the lessons learned from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand is that they didn't get it right from the day one. In Canada, they made significant changes in their system uh, over the years. And when I say significant, I think uh, some of the changes were, I think, almost structural, very important, but also this is the case for, for Australia. So anything that would be adapted to the US need to have this flexibility component, which is a challenge <laughs> in the US context in many respects. Uh, but also there is a need to uh, invest, uh, uh, and it's not only about creating a web portal and, and saying, you know, this is the new system, please apply here. There is a need to develop the infrastructure, there is a need to develop the policy evaluation, there is a need to create a feedback loop between evaluation and policy changes and the flexibility. And, and all that uh, is, is certainly uh, uh, elements that, that are critical for, for the success of, of uh, the, the failure of, of these programs. Um, also, uh, there is a need to identify and address the policy trade-off. So policy trade-off may come from, again, from this transition from temporary to permanent. Uh, in the US, like in many other OECD countries, students move to temporary program and then maybe stay and, 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 and become permanent residents. Uh, the gatekeeper in that case would be the university who pick the people, who select the people. And so here uh, you need to think uh, that carefully from uh, in terms of sharing the responsibility between the different stakeholders. You need to think about the transition, the OPT question, for example, in the US. Uh, but there is also this question of trade-off between family and, and high skill migration. You don't attract high skill migrants if you close the door to their family members. Uh, but that being said, it's fair to say that in the US, uh, family migration is taken from a broader perspective than in any other OECD countries, like with parents, siblings, and in some case, grandchild, and all that, uh, uh, all that uh, you know, may, may be worth uh, looking at, uh, obviously. So, uh, my very last slide is, is about the H-1B program because I think there is no reform of, of the U.S. Uh, highly skilled migration system without a reform of the uh, H-1B program. The H-1B program represents about 25-30% of all temporary highly skilled programs in the OECD, which is about the share of the, of the, of the uh, U.S. population in the OECD. But it's fair to say that when you look at wages, salaries of H-1B and free wage are low. And, and, and uh, particularly for those who don't have previous uh, professional experience. Um, indeed, <coughs> we made a comparison, and less than half of the H-1B uh, workers would qualify for EU blue card. Uh, uh, so very, very certainly a question here. The second question is that it's a lottery system. So uh, there, there is no ranking in, in the processing of this application. Obviously, now all U.S. master get first, but that doesn't really correspond to, to uh, a proper ranking system. So we believe that certainly in the development of a merit-based system, there is a need to rethink the H-1B program, uh, which is not very uh, selective in international comparison. And so reforming the permanent system also requires to think about temporary migration. Thank you very much for your attention. And you have more publication from the OEC right there. Thank you very much for that extremely comprehensive look at the nuts and bolts of the system and also some very thoughtful policy lessons, including on the difficulties of policy transfer to new contexts. We're going to turn now to Dimitri, who is going to talk a little bit about the different models and some of the policy implications and also respond to that presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Methuselah. I must be several hundred years old. <laughs> so <laughs> wisdom, you know, is coming out of my mouth. I just want you to know that. <laughs> take notes, take pictures. <laughs> so um, timeliness is, um, is key to all sorts of different things. So we asked the White House to pass, to have the presentation yesterday of the new system. And since we're so well connected, <laughs> I'll be obliged. Uh, <laughs> it, um, 
there is so much misinformation and so little knowledge that is, uh, I guess, informing what it is that has been proposed, that it is stunning. Um, what I'm going to try to do today, and you know, my friend Jean Christophe, who heads a, a superb team of uh, specialists, immigration specialists at the OECD, has given you a good idea of what the Canadian and uh, other similar systems are about. You know, the rule of thumb is that all innovations start in New Zealand, small country willing to experiment, able to change things that don't work on a dime. Then you have Australia looking over its shoulder, waiting <laughs> to see where New Zealand will fail and what actually will succeed. Picks it up, reworks it again and again and again. And you have the Canadians always that are sort of sitting back, realizing that their old system, which is all old in the sense that it was valid until 2015, we're not talking about the US immigration system that goes back to the 18th century. Okay, it was 1965. <laughs> it's the same thing, the 18th century. And when they find the political muscle to force a new system, they do it. It takes an extraordinary minister who doesn't give too much of a hoot about, you know, what the reaction would be. It takes a hard choice to tell over 750,000 people who had already paid whatever, $60 or whatever it is, to be in that selection system until 2015, to tell them, sorry, we're eliminating the backlog. And starting with a new system which keeps changing, you know, every six months. They try ideas, if it doesn't work, they change it. Although the fundamentals remain always the same. How do you select a group of people who will make the greatest contribution to the economic competitiveness of the country and or by having an employer who values their skills? Now, I don't want to say anything about the United States because we have Julia here. <laughs> but in case you thought that I've described the very antithesis of what we do in the United States, you might be, you know, right. All immigration systems, I, I just want to emphasize this because I'm tired of people saying, well, you know, these people were saying kill the family system or whatever. Maybe that's what the administration is trying to do, but this is only about the economic stream migration. This is only about people who are selected on the basis of a number of criteria, all of which focus on labor market needs and economic competitiveness. It doesn't speak to, to family, it doesn't speak to the humanitarian stream, and it certainly doesn't speak to the illegal immigration stream, in which I want you to know we're champions. So, I'll say only one thing about the connection between family and the economic stream. When Canada decided to go sort of full thrust into a, an economic migration points-based system back in the mid-1990s, it did it the politically smart way. It just increased, doubled the pie. So family remain intact, no changes to family, no changes in numbers, no changes in the definition. Humanitarian stream, the protection stream, has always been independent, you know. Now, this past year, they've upped their gain to whatever, 45,000. But they decided to move forward with an emphasis on a economic stream migration, and they did it. And they kept up in the ante in what number of the overall pie would be composed of uh, economic stream migrants by allowing the pie to increase. 
It used to be in the, in the hundreds, then in the mid-hundreds, then for a long time in the 260s for the total immigration system. And now the new government wants it to be 1% of the population. And they cannot meet that target because <laughs> any selection takes time. It takes more resources to bring more people in. And they are putting more resources, but not enough resources to reach whatever. The population of Canada is, what, 34, 35, 36 million? Mm. You know, in other words, you need about 340. In order to get from 260 to 70 to, two, to 340, you need to have many more people who will evaluate applications, tra la 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 la. Okay, so that's important. Let's get this out of the way. Um, and I'll make about 10 or so points. I'll try to go a little faster, but I don't speak fast, and they always yell at me. <laughs> so what I want to do is make some comparisons between uh, what we call the demand-driven and employer-led system, that's us, okay, and the points-based human capital accumulation system, because that's what we're talking about. At its origins back in the late 1960s, when Canada innovated the point system, it was all about building the human capital infrastructure of Canada. Canadian universities were few. They did not have a lot of graduate schools, an awful lot of American academics because of the Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera, and the opportunities in Canada moved there. All of those things played a role, but they decided that in order for them to jumpstart the process of economic competitiveness, they needed to bring people through some additional people through the selection of people who had you know, essentially university degrees. You know, and you know, the criteria under the point system haven't really changed all that much over the decades. Everybody wants to have younger people. You heard the president yesterday. Okay? He also wants to have younger people come in. Everybody wants to have education. And everybody has played with how you reward education over the decades. You know, there was a period of time where if you had a, a PhD, it was sort of like a, you know, get there, no problem, please come. Then they realized, <laughs> I want to apologize for all of you guys here who are PhDs, uh, that PhDs are meaningless, okay? If you have, you know, I, there was a, Senate legislation in 2013 that was going to open up to PhDs from around the world. Who the hell needs another historian or, you know, sociologist, run of the mill, who happens to have a PhD? I mean, you know, let's be realistic. We're not serious about these things in the United States. So, um, the point that I think both of my colleagues here already made, which is an extremely important point for us to bear in mind is that in reality, the two selection systems have been moving toward each other over the past 30 years. We did this when we passed legislation in 1990 and introduced the, both the top categories of the EB system, EB1 and EB2, but particularly H1B and the O, et cetera, et cetera, and you heard Jean-Christophe talk about those things. And they, meaning Australia, New Zealand, we should come up with an acronym, N-Z-A-C. Okay, it doesn't work. Countries, no? Okay, <laughs> settlement countries. And they decided that um, they were going to basically be very careful, careful about um, having the one thing that had become a serious problem that everybody was identifying. I remember giving lectures in Canada and Australia a number of times in the circa 2008, 2012, 13, saying, look at outcomes. You bring all of those people with degrees, and there is immense underemployment in your countries. And gradually, they started incorporating the employer you know, in other words, the job offer thing, which now has become sort of what everybody wants. You know, they want to have a pool of people who have great characteristics, but they also want to have an employment offer. Sometimes a job offer is a requirement, such as in the UK. You cannot come in unless you already have a job offer. 
in the Canadian system that Jean Christophe described. And incidentally, all this is on this paper that is outside. Okay, don't think that I, you know, come up with these things every day. So, <laughs> so um, what? So what they did is that when they started the express entry system, a job offer actually could take you into Canada. Almost 50% of all points were allocated to a job offer, up to 600 points out of the original 1,200. Now it's down to whatever, 20% or something, am I right? So, you know, they realized, and this is another story that I need to tell you from the United States, <laughs> that what that had created was, in a sense, a market for people who had lower skills but had a job offer. And you heard in Canada language that we had used in the United States 10 or 20 years ago, at least the Department of Labor did, which is that you not get an awful lot of cooks and things like that you know, coming under the system. So they freaked out. They started reducing the number of points that they give to job offers. And as a result, other kinds of characteristics, you know, sort of became more important. So what we have is a hybrid, hybridization of the system, which is, you know, something that um, I think that we should like. Um, because I always bury the headline and I start, you know, the movie and then interrupt it in order to go to the beginning. I like that because you perhaps because you don't like that. <laughs> the issue that we need to be thinking about is the context. And Megan already suggested this. And you can't escape it. You can't escape it today. You will be even less able to escape it in the next five to 10 years. The labor market is changing at dramatic rates. Disruption and chaos already define labor markets. Upheaval is going to be what it is that we're going to have five, 10, 20 years from now. And an unknown but very large proportion of jobs, including entire occupations, will disappear. You can argue, you say it's nonsense, etc. but guess what? We have history that teaches us that this happens. What happened, you know, with office workers in the 1990s and a little before that, with manufacturing in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And all this autonomous stuff, AI, from trucks to whatever, entire occupations will disappear. And parts of additional, parts of additional occupations will disappear. We don't know what the proportion is, Megan and I and Kate, who is, Kate is uh, the co-author of this um, uh, paper that you see outside. She's in California, unfortunately, you know, rather than here, but she's with us. Um, what we, what we see is that we really need to be very careful about making too many assumptions about how many jobs will disappear, as we ought to be careful that somehow magic will happen in an equal number of, words, of, of, of jobs that we don't know what they might be today will appear and take their place. Life doesn't work this way. Maybe in a 30 or 40 year period, that may play, you know, in a specific way, but it's not, it, not going to happen year by year. The other thing that we ought to be thinking about is extreme demographic change. Uh, I have a very unorthodox understanding and view and an analysis of how demography and migration meet. You know, I think that the US advocacy community thinks that they've come up with a perfect argument for more immigration because people are aging, because people are living in the labor market. We need to take more and more and more immigrants, except for a little thing you know, known as, you know, immigrants also age. And they need services. And they collect old age benefits. So you constantly have to take more and more immigrants in order to play that game. I know of only two groups of people 
who love ever more immigration, ever more. And I don't mean by 3%, I mean always more immigration. Advocates and <laughs> I didn't see that. And central bankers. So central bankers believe that a growth in the GDP is magic. A growth in the GDP, if it is because you have a larger population, is meaningless. But central market bankers love it. So um, let me say three or four key ingredients if we're going to be more effective and efficient in bringing in immigrants. And one of them, at least, maybe two of them, have already been um, mentioned by Jean Christophe. The first one, an essential one, is that you have to have a system that is flexible and responsive. If you think that somehow you can pass legislation today that will be relevant five years from now, let alone 55 years since 1965, Get out of the immigration business, both as an analyst or as a policymaker. Second one is the most important thing that Mr. Trump has actually understood and, and you know, sort of keeps going back at it, okay? Mind the interests of the domestic workforce. You know, we have all sorts of economic studies, particularly by macroeconomists and particularly by formal economists, who basically say, ah, you know, they're just tiny little effects, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Those tiny little adverse effects have elected Mr. Trump. In other words, the lesson is not that because of immigration we have lost the support of people. The lesson to take from here is that we have to constantly mind those people who lose from whatever it is that we do from whatever it is that we do. If we don't pay attention to that, at some point, somebody who has great political instinct, instincts will actually be able to attract and possibly be elected. We have an example somewhere. The third one is you have to constantly be on top of the system, on top of it, change it. Try to understand, try to first have an idea of what policy outcomes you're trying to achieve. No policy outcome, outcomes that serve the interest of employers or immigration lawyers or of advocates for one point or another, but outcomes for the economy and the country, the society as well as the economy. And you have to make sure that you pay attention to outcomes. You do this by telling people up front, telling the system up front what you expect from it, and then constantly testing to see whether you're actually getting what it is that you thought you're going to get with the system. And if you don't, you adapt it. Adaptability or adaptation is what you called it, you know, I call it adaptability, a key ingredient in all of this. Immigration systems must be actively managed, particularly because more and more immigrants will come, which brings the possibility that more and more resistance to immigration will come. The advantage of a system like Canada, and I will tell you, senior Canadian officials, ministers, deputy ministers, that I've talked to on a regular basis for 30 years, make it very clear that the selection system is the only part of the Canadian system that has no one arguing for it except the public service. In other words, it doesn't really have stakeholders. Employers would rather have a system like the United States. You know, I want Jean Christophe, I bring him in. You can. I can. <laughs> 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 and. and you know, if you want uh, something else, you know, you can do that. Same thing, family. Family wants to have more family. They advocate, they organize, they push. Nobody's pushing. 
for the immigrant selection system that is points-based, plus, 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 which is a remarkable way to actually see all this. And the final one, and I guess I'll stop because you're, you're just staring me down. Okay? I'm tired of it. <laughs> I'm just wondering what to write on my note. <laughs> and something that people don't really understand about all of these systems, all of these systems are adjusted, adapted, changed, et cetera, et cetera, on the basis of integration outcomes. I understand that this country doesn't really believe in integration. Okay? They integrate, you know, into their own communities. Okay? No reason to spend money, no reason to, to start serious work and you know on integration, et cetera, et cetera. Some we spend a lot of money, particularly education, et cetera, et cetera, but you know, the concept of integration, you know, doesn't really go deep. And the work that this place does on integration is with states and localities, because that's where all of these things happen, integration. The successes or failures of immigration when it comes to how people integrate, okay, are played out on the street, on the ground, cities, states. So these systems look at integration outcomes and they say, you know what? Let's ask for better English speaking ability or in Quebec, better French speaking ability because we see all the evidence. We have, what do you believe, longitudinal studies in these countries where they look at immigrants, you know, over time and see what works and what doesn't work. Us, longitudinal studies, heck, what is that? So when they look that something needs change, when they find that something needs change, and guess what? <coughs> they change it. So I'm going to stop because I don't like everybody looking at me like that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I will, um, you know, leave it at that, if we're going to be ser serious about immigration and immigration reform, not only do we need to address some of the people that Democrats and people, you know, who think um, uh, about these issues say, which is do something about the 11 million, certainly do something about the DACA. They're not kids, but the DACA people, um, et cetera, et cetera. In order to be able to get on with the business, of selecting people who can help us now and in the future. And those people are not going to come. Yeah, they're going to be some exceptional family members. But in a concentrated way, those people will come out of selecting people with the criteria that spell success. That is what we need to do as a country. I don't have the slightest idea whether they're capable of doing that. Thank, Thank you, you Dimitri. And um, I know I was slightly glaring at you, but I actually think you did an amazing job in synthesizing all of the history of labor migration and how you build a system into 25 minutes. Um, so actually, it was thank only you for 21. being so succinct. Um, I'm going to turn now to Julia, who has the rather difficult job of responding um, from a US policy perspective to all of that. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Megan. And that certainly leaves me a lot to say. Um, Given how much the U.S. has, or how stagnant U.S. policy has been since 1965 and how much the world has been innovating, I think we could probably talk for hours about all of the things we could learn from the many experiments around the world, but I'll just offer a few comments. And I wanted to start just by laying out the context in which we're talking. Of course, President Trump yesterday announced the White House's new immigration plan, and we're lacking a whole lot of details on that. Um, but the broad strokes are moving from a primarily family-based system that we have to a primarily skills based system and moving from a system in which employers and family members select migrants to one in which the government would be selecting people through a points-based system with the intention of upskilling the whole system. Uh, were this to move forward, this would be really contentious. The political future is pretty unclear. Um, but as Megan mentioned, this is you know President Trump's interpretation of a merit-based system of moving toward a more skills-based system. Would this really change the skill mix of those coming through our employment streams? It's a little bit unclear. We have a fairly high-skilled employment-based system today. It's a smaller share, of course, of our total immigration, but it's unclear how much that would shift um, in the characteristics of who would come through the skilled-based system. 
But could we in the US take a broader lesson from these points-based systems around the world and think through a well-designed, agile, um, government-run selection system aimed at selecting those who could bring the greatest economic benefit? And how would that look different? Um, so we might consider, in that case, our labor market needs across the skill spectrum of the workforce. So right now, we rely a lot on immigrant workers to fill jobs in our farming industry, in construction, in our healthcare industry, and in all of the many jobs that are supporting our aging population, as well as on the high-skilled end. So if we took a look at our labor market and we tried to design a points-based system, what would that look like? Who would we really be selecting? Would it really be such a high-skilled system intended to select only those with the highest skills and credentials, the best English skills? Um, and what are the trade-offs for this? So right now, our family-based system is bringing in all kinds of people who do work, and they are filling these jobs across the economy. So is it better for the government to have the role in selecting these people? Is it better for family members to have the role? And I'll get to this point about data, but right now we don't know. We don't know how family selection is working. We don't know whether, we know a lot of college educated people are coming through all of our immigration streams. Um, but are we really maximizing our use of their skills? Is there a lot of brain waste, particularly in the family selected streams? There's a lot that we don't know. Um, and we would need to know in order to design an effective points based system. So there, of course, are many benefits to having a points-based system. It could select not just on human capital and not just you know, privilege and employment offer, but we could think about other characteristics. So um, in moving, perhaps, away from a family-based system to an employment-based system, could we also include some family ties in a points-based system? We know that family is key in integration here in the United States, and this, a points-based system would allow this kind of flexibility to mix in different types of characteristics that could be selected on. Um, another key thing we could learn from around the world, whether or not we have a points-based system, is, is getting away from the gigantic backlogs that we've built up in our immigration system. So that's one of the key benefits of the expression of interest system, um, is having you know, regular selection and people enter the pool, and if they're not selected, they leave the pool and they can reapply. But there's not kind of this promise made to people that someday we'll let you in, but first you have to wait decades or at least several years before, we'll let you, before we let you in. And in the meantime, we're losing people's human capital, people are aging, we're missing their prime working years. Of course, a really big catch of moving these types of systems into the US is our presidential system and our Congress that finds it impossible to tackle immigration reform. So how can we build in this flexibility? Is it even possible in the United States to create an agile system to regularly change what um, points are assigned for, how many points are given for different things, how many people are allowed through each type of stream? Um, we really find it impossible to regularly adjust these things. So we would have to think really carefully about a pretty major reform to change how um, we run our immigration system and who has that power and, and try to build in some mechanisms for flexibility. Here at MPI, we've talked about a standing commission on immigration as a way to build in flexibility. It would take something like that to make this type of system work, I think. And the second point is, as jean Christophe mentioned, feeder visas become really important in a point-based system. If, if you take kind of the building global consensus that we should select migrants through a mix of points for human capital and then an employment offer, how do migrants come and get that employment offer and build that relationship with the employer? It's through the temporary system. Um, and as jean Christophe also mentioned, we are here in the US not particularly thoughtful about that. It is the universities and particularly the H-1B <coughs> visa that's driving our employment-based system. Um, we don't know exactly to what extent, but we know it's a great extent. Um, and if one were to sit back and design an immigration system from scratch, I don't think the H-1B visa would be the mechanism that we would design to drive our employment-based system. And in particular, we would have to think much more carefully, or we should think much more carefully, about aligning our temporary and permanent visas. So our temporary visa has no per-country caps. Our employment-based visa does. We're creating huge backlogs from certain countries because of this. Um, the H-1B visa is used particularly in certain industries, in the tech industry. Our employment-based system wasn't necessarily designed to be so narrowly focused on, on particular industries, but that's kind of how things have evolved here. So we need to do a lot more thinking about creating those temporary pathways. And in particular, if we think we have, we want to let in immigrants in our skills-based system in middle skill jobs or lower skill jobs, how would we create the temporary pathways that would create those matches between workers and employers to then have employment sponsorship or have a points-based system that heavily <laughs> privileges employer sponsorship across the skills spectrum. And then the last point I'll make is just, as Dimitri mentioned at the end, we don't have the data here to create this kind of system or evaluate this kind of system. So 
all of the countries that have points-based systems run longitudinal surveys. They can see that people selected through a particular path of entry, how do they do in the short term? Are they employed? What kinds of jobs are they working? What are their earnings? What does their integration look like? And then how are they doing over the longer term? And they regularly use these longitudinal surveys to understand how to revise those point systems and select people for both short-term and long-term success. The last time we had these, these data in the US was a survey run in 2003. Um, it had some challenges. It's been underutilized. And since then, we know nothing about how people fare by class of entry, which would be really important to know. We also don't even know the most basic things about how people are using our immigration system. You would think we would know that people come in on this kind of visa and they switch to this other kind of visa and then they eventually get a green card through this category, but we have very little data to look at that. Um, USCIS is working on digitizing their records. This should someday enable us to look at these things. Um, in the meantime, probably there are more data we could see if they were only released. Um, but we don't know, you know, how many people come through a student visa and then end up adjusting through the family-based system or come on an H-1B and are waiting a long time and then end up falling in love with an American citizen and, and entering through the family-based system. How many students are staying through an H-1B and through an employment-based visa? How many are dropping off somewhere along the way and why is that? And are those talented people that we should have retained or are those people who weren't a good match with our labor market? We don't know any of this. So... In order to adapt any of these lessons from around the world, we first need to build the data and research infrastructure here in the United States um, so that we can understand how our system is and isn't working and, and evaluate any type of new system as well. So I think I'll leave it there and leave it for the discussion. Thank you so much, Julia, for that um, thoughtful look at applying things to the US context and not just thinking about the fundamental things that could change, but also the incremental changes that would be um, a good first step. Um, in the interest of time, I mean, I have many, many questions, but I'm going to open it up to the audience because we only have 25 minutes for questions. Um, I just wanted to remind those of you who are joining us online that you can tweet questions to at Migration Policy, you can use the hashtag MPI Discuss, or you can email events at migrationpolicy.org. And yes, please, at the back, could you, you had your hand up, right? I did. Could you introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you. I'm uh, Rick Swartz. I'm not Socrates' uncle, like Dimitri is, but um, I've been around a pretty long time, too, since the late 70s on these, founded the National Immigration Forum, et cetera. So um, in understanding national interest and putting the judgments to be made in the context of what's good for the U.S. or what's good for Canada, here's the question that occurs. Um, brain drain. So there's been no mention of the consequences of these variety of we want your best and your brightest and that's going to be good for us. Well, what are the consequences for the societies that these best and brightest um, um, depart? And do we have a national interest in taking into account what are the consequences for the home countries? So, for example, now uh, let's take El Salvador. So we got a lot of really smart, educated people from El Salvador that have come here over time in a variety of ways, most many as asylees or now have temporary protected status. Many are poor. But El Salvador is a mess. And a lot of their best and the brightest are gone. So is that something we should be taking into account as we're devising systems to address our own national interests? And as does our national interest include, what are the international consequences that may come back to haunt us over time? Great, thank you. One more question? Okay, can I start, Jean-Christophe, would you like to respond? Well, um, no, I, indeed, I think this is, uh, this is a fair question. Uh, if there is a competition for talent, we should also think about what are the consequences for the countries of origin, even if, uh, a fair share, about half of, of these highly skilled migrants, will come from other OECD countries, so they're not necessarily coming only from less developed countries. But I, I think this is this is a, this is a fair point. And uh, in in what I've said, there is a need in re reforming the permanent system to rethink the temporary. I think there are also some innovative ways to think about temporary highly skilled migration program. One is skills, uh, global skills mobility partnership, which are looking at innovative way to share the responsibility between countries of origin, destination, but also employers, 
in terms of uh, training the people, skills development. So the question becomes not only how I track people from with, with the skills uh, from abroad to to my country, to my economy, but also how I can contribute to the investment in the skills development of the people uh, who may come to my country and maybe they go to the third country, maybe they go back to their region or country of origin after. So this is a development uh, which was initiated in the context of a discussion on the Global Compact for Migration. Uh, the European Commission is paying some attention to that in the context of pilot project that they are developing. Um, I think this is, this is a new way to think about uh, how to share uh, the, the, the cost of, of training between migrants, country of origin, employers, and country of destination. Another element in the response is that a large share, and you say you don't know, but, but about two-thirds maybe of immigrants uh, would uh, come from the international education program in many of the OECD countries. Also, this is one way uh, to contribute to the skills development. So if the selection process goes through international student program, um, it means that not all the cost for the education is bared by the country of origin. And because not everybody stays, I mean, there are about 1 million H-1B in the US, about 120,000 every year. The EB programs is much smaller, but the way is so small that clearly not everybody will make it. Uh, even if you increase a little bit the numbers, uh, I mean, some people will go back to their country of origin. But, but I think this is an important question. Again, you need to think about that in a systemic manner, about how you compete with the others, but also about uh, what can be the impact on some countries of origin. I think this is a very important point. It's a real good question, Rick. And um, we have, um, we, not just you and I, but as countries, you know, have discussed and agonized over this, et cetera, et cetera. And interestingly enough, the way that some of those things become old-fashioned, we decided to make this old-fashioned by arguing that drain, brain drain is a static concept, and we need something more dynamic. And the dynamic thing is what it is that Jean-Christophe was talking about. The Europeans, who at least say that they care much more about, about this thing, so I don't know, you know, the global compact, you know, we're heavily engaged in this, and so are you guys, um, have hoped for many years, and hope even more in the years ahead, that they can get around that issue in the simplest and the most significant way. If you want to reduce the effects of brain drain, expand expand the group, the proportion of the population over there that gets educated and trained. And in order to do that, you engage your private sector. Okay? In other words, create incentives for employers, U.S. employers in this case, to go and invest over there, train people, educate, pay for education. This way you expand the pool of workers. So you can take more but you're leaving many more behind. And this would be ideal in the ideal worlds that sometimes, you know, we are all given to. The reality is that those things have to be legal channels, you know. We need to make investments in, you know, in, in these countries that will help employers, you know, sort of welcome employers to go and take chances. We have to make sure that we protect the interests of employers that go over there. We have to do, you know, trade deals, which we have with the Central, with CETA, the Central American, uh, part of, um, of free trade, but the Europeans are still struggling with many of this. It's a complex topic. Um, I don't know that there is a quick answer to it. There is an answer to it, but it requires effort. How about money? Hmm? I'd like an answer by money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have to have dinner over the weekend. Do you want to respond to that, or should I take two more questions? I think we should go ahead. Okay, great. Um, two at the front, one on the left. Yes. You um, thank you for doing this. Maria Peña with Telemundo. Um, there's just so many questions and so little information on what this plan will actually accomplish if it gets through. Can you talk about, for instance, um, my understanding from the proposal 
And I don't know how different it is from the one that was rejected by the Senate last year, um, you know, the point-based system and the merit-based system. Um, say, for instance, um, if the system were, if the new system were in place now, how would parents and siblings of U.S. citizens and permanent residents uh, be able to apply for a visa and get in here based on the point factors that they mentioned? Could they come um, if the idea is to shift away from family-based um, visas? You know, there's a lot of confusion, and our readers want to know what, what's going to happen to my family members down the line. Thank you. Great, thanks. And then we'll take a question here. Let's see. <coughs> I had a, uh, a, co a question, a comment. I was wondering for what your opinion was if in the United States this transition from, let's say, H-1Bs to the EB system to green cards, what if just one simple solution, what if they just removed oh, the country, what thing? if they just removed the country quotas? What would you think would that, how would that change the system? Would that be a simple solution? I'm just wondering if that, your opinion on that. And two, in terms of disruptions, our current system, the entrepreneurs are very difficult to get, you know, H-1Bs or sponsor themselves as founders because <laughs> the departments wouldn't approve that if you're just self-sponsoring. It's very challenging. I'm wondering if you have an opinion on that. And on the last one on data, data um, about um, our migrants. There are new studies that are looking at linkages between census data and IRS data. And there is possibility, but privacy issues are the big concern, linking our visa data to the IRS data, kind of like Raj Chetty has done with other work on the United States. But that could give us a glimpse because Canada does it, where they link their students who came and they could tell you all the taxes they've paid, their income, all that stuff. That That would be that's the easy solution, I think, that we have already all this data, but we just haven't tapped it here in the United States. Okay. Oh, you need access to it. <laughs> it's not that we have access to it. Okay, Julia. Permission. Wanna, sorry. Do you want to kick off? Sure. So on what President Trump was proposing yesterday, we lack a whole lot of detail, but what it sounded like is that all family categories would be eliminated except for spouses and minor children of U.S. citizens. It's also unclear if you try to play out the numbers as um, as we're giving yesterday, it's unclear if his plan would even allow a sponsorship of spouses and minor children of green card holders. So it could just be spouses and minor children of citizens, but we would need to see more detail on the plan to really understand that. But that would mean that you know parents would have no path to come in, siblings would have no path to come in, adult children. Um, of course, if those individuals were able to come in through a newly established point system, they would be able to, but they would have to have those English skills, the education, the human capital, that employment offer, et cetera, to be able to come in through the point system. So it would be a really dramatic shift from our current system and, and cutting a lot of the family sponsorship categories that we have today. Um, in terms of removing the per country cap, I mean, that would definitely help in aligning our H-1B and employment-based system. I think that's something as a country that we should be debating. At the same time, I don't think that's the full solution. The H-1B isn't designed you know, with the thought of it being the driver of our whole permanent-based employment system. So I think there needs to be more thinking about how can we select the best temporary migrants and then test out whether they're a good match with our economy and with our employers and then give them a path to permanent residence if so. Um, but that is definitely a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think the entrepreneur visas, um, others here can speak more about the experiments that other countries have been running with these types of visas, but that's something we should think about as we compete globally for the best and the brightest and for people who can create jobs and spur economic growth. That's something that we're losing out on for sure. Um, and on the data linkages, right, any creative ideas are good. I think, you know, we do have ways of doing these linkages and then giving very restricted access in very careful ways. Um, so there is a way to move forward there. So thanks. Make yes, a comment please, on this. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, we don't exactly know. We don't have, you know, exactly what it is that uh, the plan is. But I think that um, it was implied yesterday and in news reports uh, the previous week that uh, minor children and spouses of LPRs would also qualify. In other words, this constant reference to, you know, family, real, you know, sort of nuclear family, you know, simply suggests that, you know, that the administration might be thinking of doing something that this institute proposed, you know, about 12, 13 years ago, which is 
that you have to treat them equally. The siblings will go one way or another. It makes no difference whether this particular legislation makes it or does not make it. If we're going to have any kind of uh, immigration reform, I don't think that considering that we have millions of siblings waiting out there, and considering that this is the, the in a sense, the one area in which advocacy and activist organization keep on having a great defense, but people who want to reform the system keep insisting that this is the easiest category to eliminate. My sense is if we ever have immigration reform, because I don't know that we will ever have it, the siblings category is going to go. I think the adult children, also, for instance. well, the grandparents, it's interesting because it's not grandparents. They're the parents of US citizens. So they are the grandparents of children, but parents probably stay. That's my guess. Uh, on, um, on removing country limits, for God's sake, we've been trying to do that you know, for at least 12, 14 years. You know, and it's the easiest thing to do. But the only way that we could get it without having you know, a bloodbath, politically speaking, is through the appropriations process. In other words, you know, try to include it in a, in a must-pass piece of legislation, simply because most people agree with it. And let me tell you why, because uh, you know, unlike Rick and I, you haven't been in this perhaps for 500 years. Um, <laughs> the country limits were intended to make sure that we don't get nothing but as three, um, you know, uh, the people from three countries. So they tried to limit it this way. You could have people from all sorts. So this was one of the measures of diversity, or one of the things about diversity that we tried to build into the, the legislation. And there are ways to square the circle, as long as we just want to have immigration reform. You know, DACA, some sort of a legalization program. And of course, if you really want to find a way to eliminate, eliminate backlogs, you may have to create some sort of a portal whereby people who could qualify if they independently came or uh, tried to come to the United States through a point selection system and say, if you have these characteristics and you're a sibling, here's a portal for you, a way for you to come in. The one thing about immigration is it can be totally logical. It is not nuclear science. We make it a nuclear science in the United States, partly because of the fact that we don't have a parliamentary system where you know, the prime minister commands a majority in the parliament, and partly because the politics is so broken. So these are things that we can fix if there is any type of um, willingness uh, to compromise on the bigger issues. Yes, uh, no, thank you very much for, for these two questions. I mean, regarding the family migration, I think as, as Dimitri said before, there are really two options. Uh, one is to uh, work with, with fixed numbers and one is to consider that you want to promote economic migration by increasing the numbers. But, uh, one thing uh, which is fair to say, uh, and it's, it's all there in this uh, document, that I, I can give you a portrait of family migration in the OECD country was published in Antarctic Migration Outlook in 2017, compares the migration policies across OECD countries, and indeed the U.S. is a bit peculiar in that respect, because that's one of the few countries which has a pathway for adult and married children, for parents, for siblings, for grandparents, so in international comparison, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, very US specific. So some other countries have some of that, but, but not to the extent of, of, of the US. So indeed, I can understand why uh, there is a lot of pressure on, on, on these uh, elements uh, uh, in particular. That being said, and um, I, I, I'm sure that, that Dimitri would, would uh, agree with me on that, uh, when we're talking about uh, merit-based system or global competition for talent, we should understand that it's not the country who will pick the people, it's the people who will pick, pick the countries. And so it means that you don't only need to have uh, an open-door policy or a pathway for people to come in, 
you need to warm the house. You need to make your house attractive and actually more attractive than other houses. And, and, and so, again, this is uh, uh, coming into a, a strategic and holistic approach to attracting, uh, to attracting talents and clearly possibilities for spouses to come and, 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 and work uh, and for children to grow in the country uh, is a very important element. On that, the OECD will publish in about 10 days new indicators of talent attractiveness for both highly skilled immigrants, entrepreneurs, and international students. These indicators would be released on the 29th of May. will show how the US compare across OECD countries. And without revealing anything, uh, the US is still, you know, still good. I mean, still relatively well ranked, but there are countries ahead of the US. And certainly uh, not taking into account uh, the things, how things are evolving in other OECD countries will only make the US situation less and less attractive for top talents worldwide. I, just, sure. just a very short point to, to, to really punctuate the point that uh, Jean-Christophe made. The more people, the more countries enter the sweepstakes for the best and the brightest, the more the selection shifts from governments, in other words, receiving countries, to immigrants. That's what competition for talent means. It doesn't mean that we compete with Canada or with France about the best and the brightest. It's the best and the brightest will have more choices. When they have more choices, you better be able, and there are some charts here, you know, in this paper that are making that clear. I have to advertise it, okay, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> that make it clear that we just get to the point where it is more of who will choose us rather than whom do we choose. It's going to be a, comb you know, a combination of two, but I like to put it provocatively in order to stick to your minds. <laughs> Um, so I have two questions that came through on Twitter, and I'd like to add in an audience question if you have one. Um, the first is about how countries have supported um, and selected skilled migrants from among humanitarian family streams. Um, the second one is about the unbelievable backlogs for green card applications and how countries can increase processing capacity, so any um, uh, examples from elsewhere. And does, does anyone have a third? If not, I will... I, Oh, Jean, yes, please. Um, since we are talking about lessons that we could learn, learn from other countries, um, when we talk about immigration, uh, the, the blood gets boiling um, across the aisle, uh, for, for people across the aisle, across different groups. How do we um, sell this idea to the public? How to make sure that the public feels that it's in the interest of the country uh, to, to, to implement this or that type of program? Great question. Um, Julia, would you like to kick off? Sure, I can start perhaps with Jana's question, the last question, um, how to sell to the public. I think, you know, point systems have the benefit of being very clear and transparent. Um, you can go on Canada, Immigration Canada's website or other countries' websites and, you know, see how, you, how many points you would accrue. Um, it's a much clearer and more transparent system. And also the research and evaluation that we've been discussing is very helpful. So um, I recently attended a conference in Canada where there are all kinds of presentations showing, you know, the economic trajectories of immigrants coming through different channels. And they were able to say, you know, these migrants are doing very well. These migrants are having trouble. Overall, the picture is good. And so having those data can help in showing what the outcomes are and, and if they are positive and if the system is designed to um, create positive outcomes, then that can help to sell it as well. Um, in terms of skills through our family and humanitarian streams, we know that you know, increasing shares of our immigrants come with college degrees, and that includes refugees and asylees, as well as people coming through our family stream. The question is whether or not we're capitalizing on those. In our refugee resettlement system, we you know, make the greatest attempt, I think. We have a, a resettlement program, an integration program, specifically for refugees, so we can try to help connect skilled refugees with jobs that meet their, meet their credentials and their training, and we can help get their credentials recognized and their programs specifically designed to help 
those individuals make it. And the family system, it's really, um, you know, sink or swim and family members come and there's not a lot of government provided, at least integration assistance. Families provide that integration assist assistance to help them connect to jobs that use their skills, but really immigrants are on their own. And it's, I think, um, a sign of the, a testament to the United States that our immigrants actually do so well, given how little assistance we give them and that people come without having been selected necessarily on their skills, but they bring skills and are able to make their way in many cases um, through our labor markets. Jean-Christophe, and perhaps you could um, add a wrap-up comment as well, because we are nearing the end of our, of our session. But we can exceed it by a couple of minutes. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, on, on, on refugees, yeah, no indeed, I think, I think we should not necessarily uh, play one category against the other. It's clear that refugees have skills, and uh, it's also the question, and as Dimitri has put it, uh, how we use these skills and, and the efforts uh, through integration programs. And I think for refugees, these are well-established programs in the U.S. For other categories, probably less so. But uh, certainly there, there is a question about how we can make sure that everybody, whatever is the category through which he or she is entering, uh, uh, can value his skills in, in, uh, in the labor market. And, and on that uh, question of, of assessment, recognition of one qualification, uh, 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 how to value our prior work experience, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of lessons learned in other OECD countries, including in, in Europe, which have very solid integration program for, for the US context going uh, forward. Uh, but I, let, let me just say a few words about, about this last question because I think this is, uh, this is really important. It's fair to say that uh, the debate in Europe and in, in, in the United States and, and, and also in other uh, OECD countries is quite different. Uh, in Europe, it has been mostly about the fear that people will take uh, low-skilled jobs and, and will be competing on the lower end of the labor market. And there, there has been very little concerns about, uh, about uh, competition on, on the high skill end, which is understandable, uh, reminding the, the chart that I, I, I've shown before, because uh, uh, except maybe uh, uh, for intra-EU migrants, there are relatively uh, uh, lower share of uh, third country nationals uh, with tertiary education in, in, in Europe. Here in the US, this is across the board. And I think um, it all comes down to the question that, uh, that Dimitri has, has mentioned be before, which I think is very central, is who loses and, and who wins. And, and, and the economic argument saying it's good for growth, it's good for productivity, are not really playing. Uh, we need to identify who is losing and, and who is gaining from, from migration and compensate the, the losers. That's how you can make reform happen and get everybody uh, on board. I was very interested to see yesterday in the announcement which were made public that there was this argument put forward that uh, having a stronger uh, highly skilled migration program will benefit low skilled workers in the US in general. And I think that point was, I think, well taken that there is the need to sell this program uh, to the public uh, at large in terms of what can be the benefits. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this, this is obvious. So uh, uh, I think that in the design of a program, uh, it, it could be beneficial, but uh, there, might, there might be some, some, some issue. And, and again, uh, uh, low-skilled worker might not only benefit from, from high-skilled migration, the complementarity is not only playing uh, between different skill level, uh, if you think about long-term care, if you think about domestic services, I mean, some lower skill migration program can also be beneficial for uh, people in general. But but this is a fair point. Uh, uh, we need to identify the losers. We need to make sure uh, that everybody is on board. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's impossible to make it happen. I get a lot of words. True. Thank well, you, maybe Madam Chair. Word <laughs> okay. I get it. Um, just um, an observation on this last point, on this issue about uh, skills and how successful immigrants are and all that. In this country in particular, we seem to be perfectly happy to say that they're doing fine as a group, immigrants. The fact that they work in low-wage jobs, even if they have skills, we paper over. 
what it is that we need in order to educate immigrants and their children, we ignore. We say, and this institution has done a lot of ground breaking, uh, breaking the work, and uh, of course, um, Ajana and Michael Fix, who's not here, you know, have published a lot on this issue, and so has the OECD. You know, that the average education of immigrants since 2012, is it 2012, going since 2012, has grown up, and now 40%, whatever the number is, have an, a degree. And I need to keep emphasizing that in order to square that finding with the finding that we have enormous underemployment of immigrants are not two independent things. The one builds upon the other. Discrimination is part of it. But a university degree from a Nigerian a, you know, and I don't, I shouldn't have said this, you know, from a Greek university, you know, unless an employer knows what that is, what it means, what education and skills and experience people have, they are not going to pay for it. That is the only way that you can square, you know, underemployment, which is massive, together with the fact that immigrants are better educated. So we can't just be happy about the fact that immigrants are better educated without worrying a great deal and doing something. This is also about compensating, not about, about compensating the losers in the receiving population, but also making those tiny little investments with immigrants, on immigrants, that will allow them to translate their degrees and experience it to something that American employers will value. And here's another great disadvantage for the United States. In solidarity-based systems in Europe, where you know jobs you know, are compensated at a certain level, where unions are still relatively strong, where you have agreements among employer groups and employee groups, workers, and the government as to how things should be compensated, it's a little difficult, perhaps much more difficult, to really take advantage of people. In an unregulated labor market like ours, that does not obtain. So the question for us is, are we happy about bringing immigrants with more qualifications through the family system, okay, and paying them seven and a half or nine or ten dollars an hour? If we are, great. If we're not, we ought to be thinking differently about these issues. And I don't mean uh, selection. I mean, you know, about creating, you know, requirements that people have to observe in paying immigrants. Thank you, Dimitri. I think if there's been a common theme that's come from what everyone has said, it's that integration really isn't an afterthought, but it is a really the heart of how you design good selection and good immigration systems from how you secure public confidence to how you make sure that accompanying family members can thrive to this question of how you value education in the country or work experience more highly um, and not necessarily just testing people for their um, knowledge of historical institutions, which might be rather arbitrary. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers and also to the audience. Um, this has been a really great event and uh, yeah, thank you very much.